Hi, in this video I'll show you the OpenSprinkler B 2.0. It's an open source, Wi-Fi enabled, universal sprinkler controller. It can be used for garden and lawn watering, plant and flower irrigation, hydroponics and other types of watering projects. It has a built-in OLED display, an ESP8266 Wi-Fi chip, and a laser cut acrylic enclosure. It's powered from a USB port and can switch up to three zones independently. The firmware that I wrote provides a built-in user interface. You can use it to easily change settings, perform manual control, and create automatic sprinkler programs that, for example, start at specific times on specific days. I've also made it to work with the Blink app so that you can monitor and control it remotely. The reason I call it a universal sprinkler controller is that the same circuit can be used to switch both latching solenoid valves like these, which are commonly used with garden hoses, and also uh, non-latching solenoids like these, which are standard 24 volt AC sprinkler valves. In addition, it can switch these low voltage fish tank uh, pumps and other types of low voltage DC uh, valves or pumps. And you can use these pumps to feed water to flower pots and indoor plants. All of these draw power from the same uh, USB port, so it's quite flexible. This is made possible by using a unique circuit design that I came up with which leverages an onboard boost regulator and several half H bridges. I'll describe the hardware design shortly in this video. About two years ago, I blogged about the first version of OpenSprinkler B and it was in the form of an Arduino shield. Recently, I've decided to completely redesign it using the ESP chip so that it's now a standalone controller with built-in Wi-Fi and OLED display. In the following, I will describe how to connect the sprinkler valves to OpenSprinkler B. I'll show you the software features and then explain the hardware design. Finally, I will show a couple of demos with real water actions. To begin, I'll use these latching solenoids for demonstration. Latching solenoids are also called bistable solenoids. They typically come with two wires that are colored differently. The red wire is the positive wire, and the black wire is the negative wire. In this polarity, if you apply an impulse voltage, it activates the solenoid. Reverse the polarity and applies the impulse voltage again, it deactivates the solenoid. Let's do it again. So in the forward polarity, apply the impulse voltage, it activates the solenoid, reverse the polarity, and that deactivates the solenoid. So it only draws power when you change its state. Otherwise, it can remain in the same state indefinitely. To connect these valves to open sprinkler B, the red wire from each valve comes together and goes to the common terminal port. And the black wire from each valve goes to an individual zone port. If the valve comes with a special plug, like this orbit valve, the top pin is the positive and the bottom pin is negative. You can insert a red wire to the top pin and a black wire to the bottom pin and connect it in the same way as the other valves. The first time you power on the controller, it goes into AP mode, presenting an open network. Use your phone or computer to connect to this network. Then open a browser and type in the IP address 192.168.4.1. This will bring up the Wi-Fi connection page where you can select or directly type in the um, SSID uh, of your router and the password. 
If you have created the OpenSprinkler B project in the Blink app, you can copy and paste the Blink authorization token here. Otherwise, just leave it empty and you can fill it later. After submitting the Wi-Fi SS ID and password, it will take some time uh, for the controller to connect to your router. And once connected, it will reboot into client mode and you will see the IP address displayed on the web page as well as on the LCD screen here. Now open a browser window again with this IP address and it will bring up the home page. Here you can see the current time, uh, valve type, and Wi-Fi signal strength. The first step is to go to the settings page and select the time zone. Change the device name, zone names, and other settings if you want. All the changes must be authorized by a device key which is open door by default. Of course, you can modify the device key as well. Next, go to the menu control page. Here you can select a zone and duration to test the zone. Let's say we want to test the zone 1 for 1 minute. Upon submission, the home page will show the zone status and the remaining water time. You can also see the zone status on the LCD display. Now back to the manual control page. You can also create a quick program that runs uh, several zones one after another and you can reset all zones. Now let me show you how to create programs. The blue colored ones here are existing programs. You can check them, make modifications, uh, or delete them if you want. The black colored one here is for creating a new program. For each program, you can give it a custom name. You can choose between running on specific days of a week or running uh, every several days such as every five days, starting from tomorrow. Next, you will define the first run time, let's say 8 a.m. And you can define additional start times if you want, like up to four specific times, or you can let it repeat, say repeat every 60 minutes for three times. Finally, you will program the running zones. This is probably the most unique part of the program that's different from traditional sprinkler timers. Here, the program is made of multiple tasks. For each task, you can define what zones should be on during that task and for how long. For example, if you want zone 1 to run 1 minute and uh, 30 seconds, zone 2 to run for 2 minutes and zone 3 to run for 10 minutes. You can define three tasks like these. But the power of the scheduler is that you can arbitrarily change the order of the running zones. For example, I can let zone 3 run first, zone 2 second, and zone 1 the last. I can also have multiple zones uh, run at the same time, and I can create some tasks where no zone is running, therefore inserting some delay between two tasks. So this is a very flexible way uh, to program the zones. Anyways, once you are done, you can submit the program. and you can always come back to modify it later.
To check if the programs are set correctly as you wanted, you can use the Program Preview feature, which visualizes what programs will run on each day with zones represented by these colored blocks. You can also navigate through each day to check if every day is programmed correctly. At the home page, you can click the log button to see a list of the most recent events, including which zones have run, what programs have they run, and for how long, etc. Now, let me show you the Blink app. Assuming that you have filled in the Blink authorization token in the settings page, the controller will now communicate with the Blink cloud server, so you can use the Blink app to monitor and control zones remotely. For example, I'm now on my phone's 4G network, and I can go to the Program and Control tab, um, and I can choose a zone to test. Uh, let's say test zone 2 for, um, say, 3 minutes. Then I can click on Run, and then this will start the a testing program that runs zone 2 on the controller. And all this is done through the Blink Cloud server. I can also select a program to test, and uh, in the system's uh, status page, uh, I can see the current status of the zone, and which program is running, and, uh, and what is the remaining time, and so on. I can also choose to reset all zones immediately. Okay. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the software features. Now let me walk you through the hardware design. I went through several rounds of revisions and many things have changed along the way. In its current form, it contains an ESP chip, a real-time clock with backup battery, a CH340 USB serial chip, an OLED display, a boost converter which is this section here, and four sets of half H bridges here, one for each of the common zone 1, 2, and 3 terminals. The boost converter is borrowed directly from the Open Sprinkler DC circuit design. It's basically a boost regulator that bumps the input 5 volt from the USB to 24 volt and stores the charge in this 2200 uh, micro F capacitor. It has two sets of MOSFET based high side switches the first one is for switching the input voltage. So when this switch is turned on, the boost converter starts working and quickly bumps the input voltage to 24 volt. Then the first switch is turned off and the second switch is turned on. So the charge can be dumped into the H bridges. The H bridge design is somewhat unique and different from the typical ones you see. Normally, a half H bridge would consist of a P MOSFET on the top and an MOS on the bottom with the two gate pins connected together. This allows using only one digital pin to switch the half bridge, but it requires the digital pin to swing up to the high voltage, which is 24 volt in this case, and it is way above the 3.3 output voltage from the microcontroller. So I need some sort of level shifter here. And to do so, I could use this alternative half H bridge design uh, that has an additional M MOSFET to drive the gate of the PMOS. But this requires two uh, digital pins for each half bridge, and that's bad for the ESP chip because it doesn't have that many digital pins. So I chose to use two N MOSFETs. One controls the gate of the half bridge PMOS here, and the other controls the gate of the half bridge MMOS here. This allows me to still use just one digital pin for the whole half bridge. Together, when the microcontroller sends a low signal, the output of the H bridge is also low, and when the microcontroller sends a high signal, the output of the H bridge is the boosted voltage. This design also allows me to prevent the shoot-through problem typical with an H-bridge. Shoot-through happens 
when the control signal is transitioning from low to high, and there will be a point where the MMOS here hasn't quite turned off yet, but the PMOS is starting to conduct, thereby causing a shorting. To address this problem, the two MOSFETs I use here are of different types. One with a lower gate threshold voltage, like BSS138, and the other one is with a higher gate threshold voltage, like the 2N7002. This way, as the control signal goes from low to high, the second MOSFET here will turn on earlier than the first one, so it allows the MOS on the H-bridge to safely turn off before the PMOS starts to conduct, therefore preventing the shoot-through problem. Altogether, each half-bridge can be thought of as a digitally controlled switch that switches between the ground and the boosted high voltage. Normally, they are pulled all to high, so the net voltage across each solenoid would be zero at resting state. To activate a solenoid, you can pull the corresponding zone port to ground momentarily to create an impulse voltage, and to deactivate the solenoid, you pull all ports to ground except the one that you are trying to deactivate. This creates an impulse voltage in the reversed polarity to turn off the solenoid. Now let me explain how the same circuit can also work for non-latching solenoids. A non-latching solenoid like this 24 volt AC solenoid generally needs to draw a high current to get energized. And this is called the inrush current and it's similar to the impulse uh, current used to energize the latching solenoid. The difference, however, is that to keep it activated, the non-latching solenoid needs to draw current continuously from the power source. And if you cut off the power, then it gets deactivated. The current uh, required to keep it on is called the holding current, and it's generally much lower than the inrush current. So, to make the circuit work for non-latching solenoid, all I need is to add an additional diode here that provides continuous holding current that's needed to keep it on. And on the software side, I will change the valve type to non-latching type 2 so that the firmware will keep the half bridge connected to ground as long as it needs. A slightly tricky part is that because I'm running out of GPIO pins on the ESP chip, connecting this diode here requires connecting this solder jumper, which on the circuit board is this jumper here. If I had an additional GPIO pin, this diode connection can be made software controlled too. But for now, I have to resort to a solder jumper to make it work for non-latching solenoids. Okay, at last I'll show you a few live demos with real water actions. Uh, because right now the outside is covered under snow, so I've got to do these demos indoors. Uh, I have, uh, the first demo is for the latching solenoid valves. So I have these two orbit latching valves connected uh, with a garden hose to the water source and uh, they are wired to the open sprinkler B on zones 1 and 2. Um, so I'm using this uh, USB power bank to, co uh, to power the open sprinkler B for now. Um, and let's start the action. I've set up this uh, very simple test program that turns on one, uh, zones 1 and 2 um, and alternate between them uh, for five seconds each. So now I'm going to click on run now to start running this program. Okay. And as you can see, it starts alternating between these two valves and turning them on and off for five seconds each. And just repeat this a few rounds. The LCD screen shows which zone is on currently, and the home page also displays the status, including which task is running. So um, 
I can also run this from the Blink app, so I'll select the program 4 and then click on run so yeah so I can also trigger that program to run from the blink app you can see the status and from the blink app as well which shows it's running program 4 and the seventh task and then the last task and then I think after this we'll finish this program okay so that's the first demo with the latching solenoids the second demo is for a 24 volt AC non-latching solenoid valve uh, I can tell this is non-latching because the two wires from the solenoid are of the same color so there's no polarity and uh, there's no distinction between positive versus negative to operate this type of valve, the first thing I need to make sure is in the settings page, I select non-latching uh, or mono-stable as the valve type. Uh, this also shows up on the home page that it displays the valve type. I've also soldered across this jumper here, this non-latch jumper, to uh, provide continuous holding current after the booster regulator is turned off. So let's run this demo. As before, I can trigger the program 4, which is this demo program, to run. And uh, it turns on the zone for 5 seconds, turn it off for 5 seconds, and then turn it back on for 5 seconds. Okay, so now the program is over. So even though the valve is rated at uh, 24 volt AC, I can drive it successfully with just the 5 volt DC uh, coming from the USB port. And uh, again, this is possible because uh, the boost to converter provides the impulse current required to energize the valve, and then the USB power uh, provides the continuous holding current. The last demo is for a low voltage submersive type of a fish tank pump. So this kind of pump has a, a small motor inside and it's clearly a non-latching type. So I'll keep the settings uh, the same as before and uh, have the solder jump jumper on. I'll run the same test program as before and uh, as you can see it turns on this pump um, for five seconds at a time and uh, you can use these pumps to actually feed water to your flower pots and indoor plants so uh, it can be very useful to help you water your plants automatically That's all for this video. OpenSprinklerB is an open source project, so you can find the circuit schematic, firmware code, and the Blink app uh, all in the OpenSprinkler GitHub repository at github.com slash opensprinkler. You can also find out more about this project at b.opensprinkler.com. Thanks for watching this video.